not fair. It's not fair to sing that hymn. Because when that hymn is sung, I tend to dissolve in tears. And that brings me to a a long-standing disagreement I had with my brother. (laughs) The disagreement was this. When is the sermon hymn to be sung? Before or after the sermon? My contention is that it's to be after the sermon because then I can compose myself (laughs) and just let it all out. But now this is before the sermon and I'm supposed to say something. Well, it's his funeral. (laughs) And he won that argument. (laughs) There's another funeral coming someday. That's going to be mine. And do you know when this song, this very song, (laughs) will be sung? I hope my daughter is listening. Take note. It's after the sermon. (laughs) Come, Holy Spirit, help us to listen. Did you come to laugh or did you come to cry? Did you come to pretend or did you come to be honest? Can you look death in the eye, or do you blink? Blink in denial, or blinkity, blink, blank, blank, in anger. Damn death anyway. Ron, or Ronald, as he was baptized, goes by many names. Arlene calls him Ron or dear. Kids call him dad. Grandkids call him grandpa. His classmates call him doc. Many of you call him pastor. We're short. And I have to be short. I got 18 minutes. (laughs) We're short. I'll call him Ron. And you know, he threatened. He said, Ted gets 18 minutes. I want him to preach, but he gets 18 minutes. And if he goes over 18 minutes, I'll sit up in that casket and cut him off. (laughs) When you're friends, you can do that kind of thing. (laughs) Those of us who have participated in one of the Bible classes over the past year with Ron have looked death in the eye with him, perhaps shuddered, and then spoken a victorious gotcha. And he reveled in unpacking that gotcha. But gotcha is really only a substitute expression. What Ron really said was, Jesus, Jesus is victor and Lord. And let me explain. About a year ago, the Saturday morning Bible study I was attending under his direction was hopscotching. Now that's his word, hopscotching through the Gospel of Mark. We landed on the square called Transfiguration. This is what came out of our discussion. We discovered that Jesus in this scripture was teaching us how to face death as a child of God. Jesus was aware that his disciples were quite hesitant to face death with him. He spoke about it with some frequency. But in the Gospel of Mark, we read, they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Afraid to ask him about it. So Jesus provoked the situation the transfiguration, which was intended to help them move through their fear and to really, really discuss it. He brought some heavyweights into the picture, Moses and Elijah, and started talking about his departure. His departure. That is, his impending death. 
He didn't actually, at that moment, look like he was pale with the fear of death. Instead, he was brightly reflecting the very glory of the presence of God. Yet, yet he was talking about death, his own and theirs, because of their association with him. So, lesson number one. You face death as a child of God by openly talking about it. Talking about it in the glorious light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Do you have such honest conversations about death? Really honest? I was privileged to be in a hospital room at St. Joe's about three weeks ago with Ron and most of his immediate family. They were together, and under Ron's limited but clear direction, they were looking death right in the eye. I think we all shuddered together. And then Ron made very clear that in Jesus, he was more than ready to face it. He gestured heavenward with both hands. Amazingly, and I do say amazingly, Arlene was in full agreement. Yeah, she's nodding yes. Amazing. Why? They honestly and prayerfully talked through all the options. And as serious as the situation was, laughter began to break through the tears as Ron's prophetic last sermon preached at ULC at noon on the first Wednesday of Advent, moved towards its fulfillment. God was answering Ron's heartfelt prayer that every vestige of sin be rooted out of his life. He had said he could imagine not being hungry or thirsty anymore. He could even imagine not having any more pain. But what he could not imagine was no longer having any sin in his life. Well, he knows what that feels like right now. The second lesson that the story of the Transfiguration taught our Bible discussion group was to face death with our ears tuned in to that voice from the cloud which said, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Talk about a loaded sentence. That voice from heaven didn't waste a word, but weighted each phrase with meaning. As I listened carefully to that voice, the voice of God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, I hear three awesome, but at the same time fear-destroying truths. First, the man named Jesus, who had been baptized in the Jordan by John and was headed for an ugly execution on a Roman cross, is called my son by his heavenly father. God stood by his son to the bitter end. And so he now has stood by his born-again son, Ron, as he faced a difficult death. Secondly, the voice called this death-destined son chosen. We might say extraordinarily special or without peer. But who calls a man who was condemned to death by a court of law my chosen one, my special son, 
my treasured son, condemned sinner though he was, the heavenly father still considered Ron his treasured son, forgiven, forgiven through his connection with Jesus. And finally, the voice says, listen to him, period. Did it really say period? Well, that's what was being said by the fact that immediately after this amazing message was spoken, return to normalcy. The text says Jesus was alone. Peerless. Period. But still echoing, echoing, echoing. In the air was, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Period. Wow, what a Bible study that was. And so it was week after week as Ron taught us to listen to the voice of Jesus. One of Ron's favorite Jesus stories was that of the so-called prodigal son. I'm sure it was a favorite because he identified so strongly with this son. A son who had a wonderful life, but who strangely was attracted to things threatening death. Things that could easily lead to a premature death. Well, Ron was honest. And he talked to us. As he was also willing to talk to the people here at St. Luke and elsewhere. He talked to us about things in his life of which he was not proud. Now to face people with such self-revealing and embarrassing stories is like facing a little death. Death of ego. The prodigal son had to face such a death. You can just feel the shudder of facing death when half-starved in a foreign country among the for the Jews, abominable pigs, he comes to his senses. There's a moment of lucidity and is willing to face the death of pride in the hope of finding some kind of life. And he says, I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, make me like one of your hired men. My brothers and sisters, this is looking death squarely in the eye because repentance, honest repentance, involves a kind of death. It says, I'd rather die to my ego and admit my shame and once again trust my Father's generosity than to die abandoned and forgotten in pigland. Years ago, Ron heard the voice from heaven urging him, listen to Jesus. More recently, Ron heard Jesus say to him and to all of us, why are you so afraid of death? Why are you so afraid to surrender your ego to me? Listen, listen to my story, not only about the prodigal son, but also about the prodigal father. 
The father who is even more extravagant than the son expected. Listen. Hush. Listen. When Ron listened, this is what he heard. And what he wants us to hear. Listen. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. Folks, this is what Ron wants us to hear about facing death with confidence. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Jesus then interprets the father's action with these words coming from the father's mouth. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. Was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. Ron wants you to know, brothers and sisters, that whatever manifestation of death you are dealing with, you can face it with full confidence that God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth has hitched up his robe and is running to meet you with the life of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Through him, through Jesus, he removes every trace of sin and he says, come, come, let's celebrate. Before we move on to celebration, let me share briefly something of my very last real back-and-forth conversation with this very good friend three days, three days before he died. Do you know what subject he kept bringing up? Here are some examples. He knew Pastor Scott had accepted a call, and he kept asking, like a father, concerned for the life of his children. Who will be caring? Who will be caring for the people at ULC? He also knew that Pastor Justin had been in an automobile accident. And so he asked again, who will be caring? Who will be caring for the people at St. Luke? He knew Paul Gikas was no longer able to make it to church service, so I told him before he'd asked me, yes, I'm caring for Paul like you asked me to. <laughs> good, good, he responded. Ron listened to Jesus, who said, care, care for my sheep. Among the sheep he cared for was not just an old priest named Ted, but a middle-aged Ted who was at that time in some trouble. Trouble with certain people in high synodical offices. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I've lost my contagion. I've been fumigated. So, listen up. You guessed it. Ron risked his own reputation by being willing to identify, identify strongly with me. And together, we faced a kind of death. Jesus had said, greater love Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Ron was that kind of friend. He listened to Jesus, who grew in him an amazing pastoral heart. A pastoral heart which he obviously has passed on to the entire 
family. To tell that story, I'd need another 18 minutes plus. <laughs> so, my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we all move toward facing death, in one form or another. Listen. Listen to Jesus. And to what Ron, an intimate friend of Jesus, listen to what they've taught us about facing death. Experience the Father. Experience the Father running to meet us and saying, welcome home. Welcome home. Let's celebrate. You listened, you listened to the voice of my son, Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Period. Hallelujah. Amen.